<clears throat> all righty, so we are officially live. I'm so excited to have you all here today. My name is Garrett Mintz. I'm the founder of Ambition in Motion. We have our guest, Vinay Singh, here. We're going to get started at 8 o'clock. So if you are jumping in, watching the recorder, we, oh, sorry, my audio is on. <laughs> Turn that off. So we're going to get started in nine minutes at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you're watching the recording of this, you can um, essentially fast forward by nine minutes. We'll get started, like I said, at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if you're jumping in early, you're going to see Vinay and I chat a little bit before we get started. So Vinay, if you could just maybe introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us a little bit about you and some of the work that you're doing. It's really fascinating. Sure. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, I spent 20 years three decades through two pre-recession, recession and post-recession uh, periods uh, in heavy talent acquisition uh, and human resources. Um, in a time where, when I first started, talent acquisition was never on site. So I started my first 15 years in an agency setting. What does that mean? That means you work for a professional services firm managing 10 to 20, sometimes up to 25, 30 clients at the same time. Uh, staffing all of their uh, short and long-term strategic goals. Um, so it's very interesting. Gives me gave me a great background. I probably have supported close to 200 companies, uh, managed uh, large teams up to 21 people in three or four talent acquisition groups. Um, financial services. Uh, I'm in uh, the North Jersey area, so basically Philadelphia to uh, Manhattan. I might touch Connecticut as well. Um, some Boston as well as Silicon Valley, but um, uh, biotech, pharma, retail and apparel, fashion, professional services, manufacturing, you name it. So that's my background in my career. Uh, about 2017, I decided to take myself off the market. Um, my company had an M&A, &A, merger and acquisition. And uh, at that point I was looking for a job, but uh, for a number of years I had seen things from a larger scope about what was creating the disengagement in corporate environments. And I wanted to address it and I wasn't sure how. Mm -hmm. um, something changed in 2018 when I got into Columbia. And uh, that's this is for another, uh, I guess maybe another question or something, but a friend of mine called me the ultimate epitome of irony. And so a, a number of people have uh, been asking me about that. But I decided at that point, I'm going to write a book to address what a lot of people really don't know. And a lot of people, you know, it's kind of just under the covers of what's going on with kind of the, the deterioration of, of employee engagement and, um, and, and some of these things. And so I've been addressing that in my first book, which was just released on Amazon. Uh, it's trending very well. I actually hit number six on the Amazon's top 100 bestseller list for ageism in the workplace, number seven in federal education legislation, number 10 in business health and stress, and number 10 in, in labor and employment law. And next year, so I've already finished my second book, but it'll be out next year. And that is very specific to gen, Generation Z leadership and how to navigate the crazy, chaotic, hyper-driven world that uh, we live in today. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Um, yeah, Vinay, that's so fast because you've done a lot of work in, in a lot of research into this. So you're coming very much, you come from the experience of being in HR, someone who's interviewed and worked with, like you said, hundreds of companies. Um, and then on top of that, you've then gone to the research side to really identify and dig into what's going on with work and the future of work and how people's lives are being impacted, which I think is really, really fascinating. I think it's really cool because I think I mean, a lot of, I mean, every student that's in here, they're already starting to be forward thinking because they're someone who said, you know what, I can learn from a mentor. I can learn from someone who can give me guidance and insight and I can build a deep relationship with them, which shows a lot about the people who are signing up in their character in terms of the ambition and motion program. And I think that they would be really interested in a lot of like just that preparation for your future, I think can go beyond that. And I think you've done a lot of research into the economy and, and how uh, ageism in the workplace can affect even people that are Gen Z. Would love if you like had a minute or two to share about this. By the way, just one quick inter interlude. If you are watching right now, you are not late. We are going to get started in four minutes, four minutes. But Vinay and I are just chatting a little bit about um, just some of Vinay's background, some of Vinay's research, that sort of stuff. Uh, Garrett, I, I lost you there for a minute. Did you, were you, uh, did you lose me for a minute? No, 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 no. Everything was good um, on our end. But yeah, anyways, all I was just saying was, 
that you have done a lot of really awesome research into ageism in the workplace. I was just saying that students who sign up for this program are very forward thinking about their lives and their careers because they're signing up to get a mentor. They're signing up to get that guidance. And so I think a lot of your research is fascinating in terms of like what is next for the future of work and how people can best prepare themselves. So if, if you wouldn't mind just shedding a little light into your work and some of your research. Okay, sure. Uh, well, um, when it comes to, so I'll, I'll break it into ageism, and then I'll go into wagesism. So age discrimination is, um, I think a large portion of society uh, still considers ageism as senior citizens or older people. And what has actually been happening in this 21st century is that career longevity has come down, down, down. Uh, there are parts of this country, many parts of this country, where ageism starts at <laughs> the age of 50, and that might be in maybe middle, uh, the, the Midwest, but on the East and West Coast, you're actually seeing ageism starting as early as 35 in San Francisco and some of the bigger cities on the East Coast at 40, 45. And so age discrimination is something that is right now touching, sure, boomers, but the baby boomers, but Generation X, and the oldest millennials are in their 40s. So they're kind of like batter up. And it's and, and if they're in Silicon Valley, they could, if you're 42, you've been experiencing it for seven years. Um, so it's important that Generation Z coming out of college understands this isn't your, your, your grandfather's time. Um, longevity of career has, is drastically being deteriorated and uh, reduced. Um, and often, no matter how much reskilling you do, you may find yourself uh, being age discriminated. Uh, then there is the other part of my advocacy, which is uh, income and wage inequality. So you, you, this is a kind of a, a, a common knowledge, uh, I believe, uh, at least for me and, 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 and what I do, but uh, right now in America, we have the greatest wealth inequality of all developed nations on the planet. Uh, this is a fact. And I'm not, so I'm saying developed. I'm not saying third world country. So in the wealthiest nation on, in the country, we should not have this. Uh, why is this occurring? And so the, taking the age, the reduction of career, uh, my father worked at 65, my grandfather worked Actually, to be fair, my dad is still working and my grandfather, but I'm just saying in general, uh, you know, you, you expect to, to have a career to 65, and then you go right into your golden years and you collect your pension or your social security benefits. That is not the case anymore. We don't have that world anymore. So it's, it's important to be conscious. And I think Generation Z is more conscious of this uh, than some other generations. You know, you say that, I don't know, I, I'm not Gen Z, I'm millennial, um, so I'm 27 years old, but I would say that I, I probably am, am guilty of this. I don't probably fully understand the ramifications of not having social security or pensions or anything like that. I, like, I don't think I fully grasp it yet. And I know that like, I'm consciously aware of this and I know that I should be preparing. Um, I think we I have an AE there. I'm here. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I was just gonna say, um, yeah, I, it's, it's fascinating. Cause I, I feel like I I'm consciously aware that these things are going away, but I don't actually know if I'm consciously prepared for exactly how to do that. And I think that's maybe the case for other people that are facing that, but that's a conversation for a different time, but hey, I'm excited to jump in with you. Um, it is eight o'clock. So we are going to get started. Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Garrett Mintz and I'm the founder of ambition in motion. We are going to be talking about professional interviews this evening. We're going to be talking about how can you make the best impact when it comes to the interview. Now, our guest is Vinay Singh. I'm going to give you a pro I'm going to give him a proper introduction um, in a little bit, but I wanted just to set the preface for the workshop this evening. So this workshop is going to be 45 minutes long with about another 15, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the very end. List your questions in the comment section. So during this workshop, we're going to cover how to achieve success in the program, how to expand your network and begin having conversations with people you want to surround yourself with, and how you can begin working towards your goal with your mentor. So by this time, you should have already had your first conversation with your mentor, potentially even your second conversation. 
And if you have, amazing, fantastic. If not, get on it, get started. You're not too late, just get working at it. That's definitely the key there. Now, one thing that we've talked about before, and I'm gonna talk about it again because I know how important it is, and that is the three keys to success in this program. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you a question because you all are here. You are all probably in a scenario where you're currently interviewing for roles or potentially are about to start interviewing for roles. Even if you're a freshman, I know that this is something that's gotta be on your mind in terms of how can you best prepare yourself. So I had a question for you, and I wanted just to learn your thoughts about this in the comments section. When it comes to the interview, how do you want people to feel about you? I think for this workshop, I really want to focus on the intentionality of how you want people to feel about you or just the intentionality of your time. Like, are you spending your time intentionally or are you just going through the phases and you don't really know exactly why or how you do the things that you do? I want you to truly think about that. So the, the question I have for you is when it comes to the interview, how do you want people to feel about you? So put it another way, what feeling are you trying to convey about yourself when it comes to the interview? Write that in the comment section. I love to learn a little bit more about your thoughts about yourself and how you want people to be, how people, how you want other people to perceive you in the interview process. Because ultimately what I know is that when it comes to you and interviewing, your intentionality is crucial to ultimately being successful in that interview. Because if you, you, you're not consciously aware about how you want people to perceive you, it's going to be very difficult for you to get that outcome that you want. But when you tell yourself a story for why you're going to be that certain way, it's much more likely that you're going to get the outcome you're hoping to achieve. So Amanda, you wrote, you want people to think that you're really confident and passionate about what you're interviewing for. That's amazing. Joey, you mentioned that you're genuine and that you want to pursue a career doing meaningful work. That's amazing. Eli, you mentioned, oh, you're just signing in. That's cool. Maddie, you mentioned that you want people to walk away feeling like I was professional and also competent at technical parts of the interview. I think it's a really good point. Anderson, you, you mentioned that you want to believe that you know what you're talking about and are willing to learn. Anna, you mentioned that you want to, people to perceive you as confident, professional, and excited to learn and create an impact. That's amazing. Robert, you said that you want to be perceived as confident, passionate about the work you're pursuing, and also curious and open-minded enough to keep growing in the workplace. Sydney, you want people to feel like you're confident. I love it. Ursula, you want people to perceive that you're attentive. Kayla, Kaylee, you want people to know that you are interested in their career. I think that's a really good one. Eli, you want them to know that you're prepared for interviewing by knowing and learning about their company. Kaylee, I love what you wrote about people being, that you want them to feel like you're interested in their careers because that's what we talked all about in our last workshop of just really people love to talk about themselves. So if you take the time to listen, they're going to be so much more engaged in what you have to say. So I love that. Abhishek, that's awesome. Ha, that's amazing. Thank you so much for posting, everybody. I love the interaction um, from this question. That's fantastic. But getting back to the three keys to success in this program, the three keys are strategy, story, and state. Now, I say them in reverse order of importance because it just allows us to get started and allows us to kind of set the tone for this workshop. So state, that is the most important key to being successful in this mentor program. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're going in for an exam. I don't care if you're about to meet with your mentor. I don't care if you're about to go in for an interview. I don't care if you're about to go in for a networking night. If your state is not physically conducive for being successful, you won't be successful, plain and simple. So it doesn't matter if you're having an off day, if last night you took an L, because tonight you're going to bounce back <laughs> just to make a joke off the song. But the point I'm getting at is that you've got to get yourself into a physical state conducive for being successful. So. When it comes to preparing for that interview or pre preparing for that exam, you can get into a power pose. But one thing that I like you to do right now is I like you to stand up and I like you to shake it out. I like you to get loose. I like you to get amped, get pumped. I want you to scream at the top of your lungs. I just want you to go up and scream at the top of your lungs on the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah! Just let it out. Let it loose. Let it go. Get that blood pumping because when you get your blood pumping to your brains, you're releasing endorphins. You're getting yourself into a state conducive for receiving information and retaining information. And that is where I want you to be for this workshop because we've got a lot of information to give. If you just hear, are here and you're watching and you're just like, oh, well, I was there. I just kind of sat and relaxed. The likelihood that it sticks in your brain is so much lower. But if you are in a state conducive for being successful, you will be so much more likely to remember what we say. If you've ever been into a classroom where you've got a multi-hour lecture, I can promise you, you don't remember the majority of what was said because you are stagnant. Your body is stagnant. But if you're getting up and you're moving, you're getting loose and you're shaking it out. You are getting yourself ready and can prepared and conducive for receiving and retaining information. So the state is the most important part. And by the way, it's not a popularity contest. I don't care. 
you disrupt somebody next to you. I don't care if everybody's like, what is that guy or what is that girl? What is she doing? It doesn't matter because ultimately it matters is that you're here and that you're making the most out of this program. And so if you are here and you're going to make the most out of this program, get yourself into a state conducive for being successful. Now, the second part and the second most important part is a story. What is the story you tell yourself for why you're going to be successful? So that first question I asked you was, what is the what is the intention? What is the feeling you want people to feel about you when it comes to going into an interview? And that's something that I think is so important because ultimately that allows you to set an intention. Now, maybe you've saw, thought about this before. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. But I want you to begin thinking about this. I want you to be more intentional, intentional about the way that you spend your time. Because ultimately, if you are not intentional, if you're not thinking consciously, why am I doing these activities? You will not, you'll not be in a position that you want to be in. I mean, if you're following a roadmap, but if you're not following a roadmap and you're just like walking through life randomly or just following the steps of where you think everybody else is going or where you think you should be going, but really haven't mapped it out for yourself, that's going to be difficult to know whether or not you actually achieved the destination you wanted to get to. But if you can be intentional about the way that you spend your time or about the way that you want people to perceive you can be in a significantly better position to be successful. And that's really falls under the category of story because it's your story about why you're going to be successful, about why you're going to succeed, why you're going to thrive in your life. And so the last part is a strategy. What are the strategies that you can take to prepare to be successful? Now, that's what this whole workshop is all about today. So we're going to go with Vinay. We're going to talk about some of the things that he would suggest that you do, as well as some of the things that I'd suggest that you do to best prepare for a professional interview and how you can go about getting yourself and putting yourself in the best position to thrive. Because ultimately, if you can do that, and if you can apply these skills, you can land the jobs that maybe you didn't even realize were possible. I think the statistic was that if you had, I think it was, if you have 40% of the job requirements listed on a job board, you were just as likely to get the job as someone with 90% of the requirements. The point I'm making is that ultimately it's about how you prepare and the type of intentionality you set for yourself and why you believe that you're going to be successful and really the impression that you make. And I believe that the insight that Vinay has, he's going to give you some great tips and suggestions on how you can actually go about putting yourself in the best position to succeed. And then the last part is, so we already went over strategy. Um, so the last part I want to cover before I introduce Vinay is I wanted to talk about the deliverable from this workshop. So by the way, I apologize for our technical difficulties on our deliverable. Our ability to upload pictures on our website uh, had a little bit of a snag. So what you can do is you can send your picture directly to me or Sydney um, of just you applying the skills and the things that you're doing in the workshop um, and, uh, and doing that deliverable. And then we will count that on our end internally. But in terms of today and what we want you to be doing for this workshop is we want you to get another accountability partner. This should be someone different from the last two workshops. If you can't tell, I want to continue to get you to network. I want you to be meeting with tons of different people. I want you to start building trust and connectivity with people. So I want you to find a new accountability partner. And I want you to share your partner three things that you've learned this week from this workshop. And one thing that you've done to get closer to landing that internship or job. So one thing that I remember my grandma always used to ask me when I was younger was, what did you learn today? She'd ask me that every single time I saw her. And when I was younger, I'd say, ah, oh, nothing. You know, I didn't learn anything. Nothing was really that, you know, that stuck out to me or whatever. But she forced me to answer her. And what that did was it forced me to be intentional about actually what I learned during that day. And I think that's something that's really valuable. The reason why I think you should apply it in your life is that if you are more intentional about the what the things that you're learning on a regular basis, and you actually share that with people, it's much more likely to stick in your mind. Whereas if you just are going through the day to day and you can't even think about one thing that you learned in a given day, I mean, how can you expect to actually retain that information? So mm -hmm. I want you to start being consciously aware of what you're learning and find an accountability partner that you can share that with. Take a picture with that accountability partner and then send that to myself or Sydney and we will count that for you. So that's your deliverable from this workshop. Alternatively, you can post three things that you've learned on LinkedIn and tag us. That's another way you can do that. So the last part before I introduce Vinay is our referral program. So signups for next semester have already started. One thing that I was hoping that I could leverage your help with is getting more students from your chapter to sign up and get involved with the program next semester. If you refer three students to sign up next semester, your deposit is cut in half. If you refer um, six or more students to sign up next semester, you don't even have to pay a deposit. You are good to go to get in the program. I just, I want to be able to expose and get students connected with mentors and opportunities to grow and thrive and, and have access to these workshops. And I want to leverage your help. 
Also, if you're having a positive experience with this program, I'd also love to get a video testimonial for you, a brief 30 to 60 second, you in front of your phone, just saying, hey, this is what I've learned. These are the things that I've done. And you know, this is something that I've enjoyed. That would also really help as well. If you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be amazing. So let's jump into the program. So I'm really excited to introduce our guest speaker this evening. His name is Vinay Singh. Vinay Singh is a strategist, consultant, influencer, and thought leader in the field of talent acquisition, adult leadership, and diversity and inclusion. He has been a trusted advisor to over 200 businesses, including many Fortune 500 companies. He's a huge advocate of education and is a pre-doctoral candidate at Columbia University. In recent years, Vinay's vast industry experience has opened his eyes to the ever-changing plight of the American workforce, and he has become a leading advocate in the fight against multi-generational multi -generational ageism, age discrimination, and wage income inequality uh, in the workplace. This is age and wage crisis, as he calls it, and has led Vinay Singh to, to write his first book called Your Future in Pieces, How Ageism and Income Inequality Are Destroying America. In its sixth week six, since released, the book hit, hit, hit the rank number 14 on the Amazon top 100 bestseller list in highly regarded category for federal education and legislation. His second book debuting in 2020 is specifically, is specifically focused on Generation Z leadership and currently has the the working title, Finding Personal Engagement, Secrets of Workplace Success in a Modern, Chaotic, Hyper-Driven World. I'm so excited to have Vinay here. Vinay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Garrett. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. So, Vinay, what we're here to talk about is we're here to talk about interviews and just putting yourself in the best position to thrive during the interview. But I think before we get, in and get started with that, I think one thing that we really should focus on is the people that you're touching before the interview and the people that you're building relationships with before the interview. So one thing that I'm curious to know is how do you keep in touch with people in your network? So people that you've met with in the past that, you know, maybe you haven't spoken with in a few months or maybe even a year or two, how do you keep them in the loop with what's going on with your world? And how do you suggest students go about doing something like that and keeping their network up to date and in the loop? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a really good question. And I think there are certain social media platforms that uh, you might use more when you're in college and you might, uh, and now when people are graduating college, they'll start to move more into other platforms. For example, um, if it's something social, I'll use Facebook, Twitter, but when I, when you move towards your career, you're going to want to be doing more, posting more professional things, maybe projects that you worked on, things that, that are more uh, career minded and career focused, and you want to put those on LinkedIn. So I think social media, and this doesn't come to any surprise, but there are certain platforms that are better for posting certain types of things. Um, for example, uh, I'm a big auto enthusiast. So when I go to car events and car racing, I don't put those on LinkedIn. I never do. But I put that on Facebook and my colleagues, many of them who I met from a professional standpoint that are now my friends, and we're connected through Twitter and Facebook, they'll enjoy the auto videos and, and, and pictures and stuff like that on Facebook, but it's just not appropriate um, because LinkedIn is much more professional. That being said, anything that I achieve from a professional standpoint goes on LinkedIn. And so I keep my network uh, up to date on what I'm doing on LinkedIn. I love that. And that's really cool. So if I'm hearing you right, you're leveraging LinkedIn to share some of the things that are going on in your world, some of the things that maybe you're you're researching, maybe a promotion you've gotten or a new book that you've written. I mean, I'm trying to relate this to students. So maybe you just like got accepted to an internship, immediately update that. But also I think what's undervalued and underutilized so frequently is posting what you've learned in that internship or learned from that mentor or learned in that job on LinkedIn and tag them because one, it's a gratitude exercise. It gives them a shout out that you learned something from them, which, which is huge. But then two, everybody in your network sees what you're posting, which is a great thing. It shows them that you're constantly actively engaged. And so when you reach out to them, it almost feels like they already know what's going on in your world. Well, do you agree? Not only do I agree, I'm going to take it a step further. As you start to build out your list. So I'm, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to think that maybe a lot of people in college don't have a extensively robust LinkedIn profile. Um, you want to start to build that. You want to start to network with the people that are like-minded, A, and same career-minded as you. Uh, so for example, I'm just going to make this very generic. Uh, if you're a Cisco engineer, you're going to want to start tagging other Cisco engineers in your local area or other cities that you may or may not want to work in the future 
planning. Okay, my parents are in Chicago. I might want to go back there within three to five years. Let me find as many Cisco engineers as I can that are doing the same thing that I am. And then also managers and directors. Uh, so building up your network because these are potential hiring managers for you in the future. Uh, and as you learn things in your job, first three months, I worked on this great enterprise project with uh, some great uh, uh, senior people that showed me the ropes. And this is what I got my experience. And I was doing this enterprise cluster and mirroring project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is going to go out to your network. And if you're tagging in or inviting and reconnect and connecting with enough senior people that moving into director roles or already director roles, huh? That's uh, that's this person's uh, implementing something that we're planning to do in six months and 12 months. I want to keep a tag on this person. You're yeah, very interesting. she's very interesting. So absolutely. I totally agree. That's amazing. And, you know, I want to almost transition just slightly in terms of, well, I guess here's a common misconception. I think some people think like, OK, cool. I get mentors when I'm younger, but when I'm older, I don't have mentors. But I think that's very counter. I love to ask who are the mentors in your life? Who are the people that you actively learn from? Well, it's interesting that you uh, you bring this one up. Um, you are never too old to have a mentor. Uh, I have mentored a lot of people. I've been a director four times. I've been a managing director, VP once. Um, so a lot of mentoring. Uh, but I've always had a mentor. I've had a mentor for at least half of my career. In my workplace, uh, I have had mentors outside of my workplace, but in my career field. I'll give you a perfect example I have a colleague who I'd placed many years ago, stayed in contact for a long time. We hadn't spoken in about a couple of years, two, three years. And we had a conversation, I'd say, well, was it early last week. And he wanted to catch up and say, he said, I see all your posts. You're, you're not recruiting. You're, you're doing some major stuff in diversity and inclusion. This is great stuff. It's groundbreaking. What made you do this? He wanted to catch up and find all about this. So we spent about an hour and almost an hour and a half on the phone. It went by pretty quick, uh, it seems, but uh, there was a ton of information that he got and I got about each other. Uh, long story short, he said, I wanna connect you with two people. And I said, please, and uh, CC me. And uh, so one of the, pre uh, both people I've spoken with, one of the uh, people that he connected me to has written, he's, he's older than me, He's written 30 books. So I've written two. He's written 30. So this person, after this, we've already had three conversations to this point. And he said, you're an early leader in what you're doing. Do you even realize that? Um, and I'm happy to uh, advise you on um, your moving, your movement towards, you know, my interest in being a global speaker and author. And he says, you're well on your way, but I'm happy to be there for you. So boom, I just got a new mentor and I'm very excited because this guy has got 30 books. He's, he knows a lot more than me. I'm looking forward to learning from him. So you're never too old to have a mentor. Um, and I would strongly suggest that you keep that always in mind. Stay green, stay evergreen. Uh, knowledge is power. I love that. That's really great. By the way, students, while you're watching this, if you've got any questions that you have for Renee about the interview, please post them in the comment area. Um, because I want to now start transitioning into that, because I think one thing that we use to get our foot in the door to have an interview is the resume. What is the purpose of a resume? resume and what do people want to know from a resume? Well, <laughs> so I guess I was going to go back in time, but why do that? Today, Resumes uh, have to be pretty short. Uh, I'm against having a resume too short because I think a lot of people's experiences from beginning to end uh, should be highlighted because a lot of the things that we learn prior in the beginning of our careers uh, are, are very important and are uh, should be highlighted. But bottom line today uh, is what you are currently doing. Uh, so when you're in three to five years out of school, companies are going to want to know what have you done most recently? That's pretty much what everybody looks for. Uh, so if you're coming right out of college, what are the projects that you've done most recently? What are the extracurricular activities that you've been doing? How are you involved in groups? Um, how are you involved in advocacy? Are you involved in advocacy? These are the kinds of things. Uh, all the companies today want to know what drives you, where's your passion, uh, what gets you out of bed and want and, and, and ready to go and charge into work and, and do something uh, great. These are the things that matter. 
Today. How do you convey that in a in a resume? I feel like, and I don't, and I and I don't ever want to want to denigrate the concept of a resume, but it's a one page piece of paper. How do I convey what I'm passionate about? I feel like it's very like hard and fast. What are your suggestions? I mean, you've been doing this for years. Yeah, and so this is uh, ever evolving too, Garrett. Uh, so what's on your resume has to match exactly what's on your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile cannot say something different than your resume. They've got to match. Very important, HR is looking for a mismatch. Very important to note that. Um, That's a really interesting point. I guess what I'd be curious to know, do people ever fake it on their resume? And like, do they get caught? How does that work? You get like, is there like a plagiarism resume police? How does that like process work? How does that protocol work? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, people, people have gotten caught. I mean, I've, I've s sent thousands of people, tens of thousands of people on interviews and, and it doesn't happen that often. You know, I mean, when you're working with me, I'm going to be very straight. Uh, I'm going to look at your LinkedIn profile. I'm going to, this is from a time long gone now. I mean, we, as an executive recruiter, we spoke on the phone. We worked with your resume. We prepped you every way, you know, that, that kind of communication has deteriorated over time. But uh, so a lot more is on the candidate. So if it's on your resume and it's on your LinkedIn profile, you really, two things that are gonna bite a candidate when it comes to uh, fubbing up the resume or the digital profile. Huh? They're going to try to catch you. They're going to ask you questions. They're going to read your resume. And if you say you've done X, Y, and Z on your resume, they're gonna go into depth and they're gonna see how much you know about if it says electronic warfare, electrical engineer, okay, talk to me about 30 gigahertz uh, X, Y, and Z, and how many gigahertz have you gone down to? And uh, what kind of system were you working on? What was the black box? That's a little uh, defense uh, engineering uh, lingo. But, you know, they'll go into depth. And depending on your answer, depends on, you're going to have subject matter experts when you go into your technical interview. And when I say technical, it doesn't matter if it's technology. If you're in marketing, it'll be a technical marketing interview. They will go into nuances. And today, Everything is technical. So when you're an if you're an accountant, they're going to talk to you about their enterprise accounting software. They're going to get technical. And on the back end of that is, let's say you make it through all that, um, and you put certain dates and certain companies on your resume, or if you leave them out, it's going to show up on your background check. I mean, every company does a background check. So my advice is to be upfront. And stay up front, always. Just do the right thing. And what do you commonly see people miss when creating their resume? <laughs> well, uh, I see I spent my career looking at, you know, potentially, you know, many, many dozen per day. Uh, but I think the biggest, I'll focus on the biggest thing. People submit resumes that are not customized for the job description. Now, in a time before where I would get Garrett's resume and Garrett would send it to me and I'd say, hey, Garrett, I got your resume. Uh, it doesn't match the job description. I sent you your job description last night. I said, you know, look at the job description, make sure it's matching. I, I didn't have time to make such a, well, you know, we would work with that person and we'd make sure to do it on right there in real time. Say, hey, Garrett, can I change this for you? We're going to talk through it, and I'm going to send it back to you. You're going to approve it. You're going to send it back to me. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Vinay. Thank you for, for that time. I appreciate that. Or I'd send it to you, and I'd say, look, if you want to put your best foot forward, you've got to put X, Y, and Z because I know the hiring manager. So if you don't have a recruiter that's working with you and you're not working on the agency side, because there's still agencies that do that, and that's the extra level of, of, uh, of service that a lot of companies well, we all used to do it, and I think there's less and less and less. But if you're working with somebody uh, corporate, you have to take it upon yourself to look at the key buzzwords in that job description. There's going to be key buzzwords in the qualification. So it might have a job description that's long, and then at the end, it'll say key requirements. What are those? Are those buzzwords on your resume? If they're not, get them in there. Uh, and let me take it one last step further. Today, there's a lot of chat bots and machine learning and AI. These technologies are scrubbing your resume and matching up keywords. And recruiters are putting keywords. 
if it doesn't have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G buzzwords, don't pass it and get it into my inbox. It goes into like a spam section of the enterprise ATS applicant tracking system. So chatbots, AI, machine learning, and recruiters are looking for the buzzwords. Make sure they're in your resume. Got it. That's a really good tip. That's a really, really good tip. I wonder if there are any questions students have about resumes right now. It's not looking like we do at the moment, but uh, I would imagine that some may come up over time. I want to now talk about cover letters. This is uh, the long lost art of cover letters of how do I properly do this? How do I ensure that it's customized to the role itself? What are, what are your thoughts on the purpose of cover letters? I will say that I see less and less companies asking for them, number one. Um, we are in a time where hiring managers and recruiters and HR, everybody, uh, is out of time. And we all are squeezed and pulled, you know, spread too thin. So if your resume matches spot on to what the job description is, you're going through. If they ask you for a cover letter, don't make it more than four paragraphs. People don't have the time to read a full one-page Word document. They don't. They want to see two or three paragraphs saying, "Why your? What is your passion and interest in this particular company? What drives you, and what your skill set is that is that pertains directly to that job description? Make it about them. Can't make it so much about you. So, your passions." should be aligned with what the company is doing in some way or shape or form. Your skill set should match what the job description is in every way, shape or form. And then end it by saying, I'm enthusiastic. I love what your company is doing. I'd be a great match, a great fit. That's it. And then, so again, don't make it more than a half page. No more than yeah. a half page. I love that. I think the only thing that I would want to add to that would be as a college student, you're selling your potential. Like you're a 22-year-old person, you're selling your potential because they're not expecting an experienced vet to be jumping into some high, you know, detailed high project or situation. You're selling your potential about where you can be within the company in one, two, three, four, five years. And I believe that is something that they're looking for in the cover letter and resume. Do you agree? What do you think? Well, so you, you don't want to project and say, I'm looking forward to becoming a vice president in five years in the company or anything like that. Good tip. Uh, if you're coming out of college, then they want to know what drives you. They want to know, okay, so if it's a company that's making X widgets, they want to know why you want to come and work for them. And it should align with something that you should be able to think of all the time you spent in college and maybe even in high school. What do you do extracurricular? How do you align passion, drive towards what they do? If you're out of college and you don't have that experience, what is that? Because if you have no passion, if you can't correlate a passion and drive that you've done in college or high school that aligns with what they're doing, and you, you can't answer any of that question, there's going to be candidates that are going to answer that question. So, yeah, and it's so, so sorry, that's, I think that's so fascinating. It's very much in line with our research on work orientation. And it makes total sense. I mean, at the end of the day, if I'm a company, I'm not just trying to fill warm bodies and holes. I'm trying to actually hire for someone that I think is genuinely interested in what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, if at the end, like at the end of the day, if someone offers you a slightly higher salary, you're going to go to them. You're going to leave me. You're going to leave us in the dust. But if you feel like, wow, I'm doing something that is really impactful or that I really enjoy doing, um, that is something that I believe is really going to stand out. What do you think, Vinay? You, you. Well said, Garrett. So here's the thing at the back in the back of the corporate mind is not just do you fit today, but are you going to be a candidate that is, they will be able to retain based upon who you are? And you answered the question that is, you said it very, very well. So another can company, a perfect example is this. My first job uh, out of college, I was so engaged in my first company that I could not be recruited out of, to be fair. Uh, and I told recruiters, I said, you, what I have at my company, your, you cannot give me from what you're saying. What was that, by the way? I was deeply 
connected to my coworkers and my boss, who was my first mentor. She, it was just, a, it was just a, um, just a perfect, beautiful fit. Uh, she got a lot, you know, she, she loved, she called me her idea guy. Uh, I was very passionate about the, the company. I moved up. Uh, I worked very hard. And, and why did I do all these things? Because I loved doing what I did. I was just deeply, deeply connected and engaged in my company. And when and you can she find made you, that, oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and she made you feel respected, which is super, that's like calling you the idea again, made you feel valuable. I, I want to ask students real quick. I want to ask you the question right now. How do you, like, what do you ide like ideally envision your ideal interaction with your colleagues when it comes to your work? Do you see it as like, hey, I go to work, I go home, and that's like separation of, of work and life? Or do you see yourself, uh, you know, spending more time with them even outside of work or just trying to build deeper relationship? would love to learn students what your thoughts are about how you would envision you working with your colleagues when it comes to work. But yeah, Vinay, finish your point. I want to hear more about this. Well, I was just, I was just saying that, uh, when you're, when you're that engaged and you're that connected with your peers and your boss, and you know that your company has your best intention, $5,000 is $10,000 doesn't mean anything. It, does, it, it didn't. So, uh, you know, the sky was the limit in that company for me. And it was, yeah. uh, so, you know, like I said, uh, it, there's something that they, uh, it's an old adage, right? Uh, the gra people always think the grass is greener on the other side until they get to the other side. Um, so careful to just jump for money because money ultimately will not be the thing that brings you happiness. When you talk to a lot of the most senior people that once they retire, there was a, a great study that was done by uh, people, uh, by somebody, I think it was at USC, uh, maybe it was Berkeley, um, and she interviewed, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred people that were uh, living in the senior citizen homes. And they said, what do you regret most in life? And it was uh, from a work uh, that she said from social, you know, life, this marriage and, and, and then career. Uh, and it was um, not focusing on what was most important. And it was never about money. So that, that's all I'm saying. Uh, I've seen so many candidates that have left. I've placed people and then they've left. And uh, I call, you know, and they're not there anymore. And then I call their personal number. Yeah, Vinay, I left six months ago. I'm at this other company. Oh, I, I came for more money and it's, 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 it's terrible. It's terrible. I, I, I wish I, I made a mistake. I should have called you first and asked you for your advice. So careful if it's just about money because it, your inside passion and, and desires on what you want to do for you as a person to grow personally should align. I love that. The money that makes you align. Are um, you getting along with that man? You know, when you're interviewing with your peer, with another company, and it's you see who your peers are going to be and your manager, think about their personalities and how they're radi what if they're radiating to you, because those are going to, those are the personalities you're going to have to work with. Uh, it's so funny how emotional we are as humans towards the people that we surround ourselves with. There's that oxytocin bond. Oxytocin is the chemical in your brain that makes you feel connected to others and it fires when you're around people that you really legitimately, genuinely enjoy to be around. And that's so important to that. And I think that should be a part of the interview process, which kind of leads to my next question is, how do you suggest people prepare for the interview? And I think that goes beyond just preparing the resume and the cover letter. I think that also includes your background research, but not just research on how you can impress them with your knowledge of their company, but also how you can actually educate yourself about how you believe that you might feel about working at that company if you were to get the offer. How do you how do you and how do you suggest that students go about preparing for interviews? Yes, uh, so this you would think that this would be, you know, one on one, but uh, it's not, and it's not for. Uh, uh, people uh, that are younger adults or middle adults or even senior adults. I've seen, I, I, I've been surprised senior adults even can uh, mess this up. Uh, one of the things that might come out of a human resource professional that you're, that is interviewing you, the first thing is, so tell us what you know about us. Tell us what uh, research you've done about us. And if you can't answer that, I mean, I, I really had candidates go in and say, I, I really don't know much. Uh, my, uh, I heard that uh, my recruiter sent me for this position and, 
you know, the interview, they come, they call me within 10 minutes. I'm just like, what happened? Oh, it, was, it went great. It, it was just a really short interview. I'm like, no, it wasn't. In my mind, I, I think that was, you must have done something. And uh, then I, I get the feedback. Do your homework about the company. Go to the click, click about us tab. Learn the history. Click, go, go into Google. And if you're interviewing at Citigroup, current events at Citigroup, what are they currently doing? Did they get an uh, merger and acquisition? Was their stock market, uh, you know, quarterly uh, numbers big? Uh, say something from their history. Say something about uh, current events that they're doing. Uh, oftentimes when I do that and I prep my candidates to do that, they say, you know, that was great. I knew more about the current events than the HR professional. She was uh, very impressed. So do your homework about the company. Um, so that's important. Know the, obviously the job description. See if you can find out um, interesting things about the company and on their website, things that they are moving into. What are they doing tomorrow that you can say, I understand that next year you guys are going to be rolling this, up, this or that out. That sounds very interesting to me. I'd love to learn more about it. Can you tell me more about it? Uh, again, making about them. And that's what's important to the company. It's about them. That's a really great way of doing it. Cause that's, that's what we all, that's, I mean, literally we preached in our whole last workshop about asking questions about them because people love to talk about themselves. But if you can do that recon, that, that information, gather that and be able to recite that you would rather come off as more knowledgeable than the person you're that's interviewing you than not know enough inter information to be even considered as a candidate. Um, and I think on top of that, just like what you were saying of this sounds really interesting to me, this seems like where you're going in the future. That's where you as a, as a uh, aspiring professional can do your own personal audit. Like, where do you see the future of work going? Do you see it going in this direction? If so, great. Then that's awesome. You think you see this becoming popular? Great. You want to invest your time in building these skills to be around this because you know that the more knowledge and skills you build in this are going to be increasingly necessary. But if it's a dying industry and they're like, Hey, we're just, looking for someone to keep kind of plugging holes. Like you can take that job, but I mean, shoot, you might be, if, if that company ends up laying off people, you might be on the chopping block and then not have the skills to transition into that next role because you've been working in a dying, you know, prehistoric industry or company. What do you think? You know, it, that's really good that you said that. So while a, uh, while the, the students are looking for jobs, You'll have many, uh, hopefully you'll have multiple opportunities and interviews um, by going to the website, but more importantly, by Googling current events, uh, you may, you may see some news that uh, you're like, oh, I didn't know that the company is going through this. Hmm. Let me think about that. Uh, and why not? Sure. Ask. I understand uh, CNBC, ABC reported that the company is... Um, shutting down a couple of plants in, uh, I'm just going to make this up, Mexico and Texas. Um, can you tell me about that? Will that impact uh, this uh, department, this organization? So uh, there's nothing wrong with asking about current events. It's obviously global knowledge for the public. Uh, and it's important for you to get an answer because I can tell you, I have placed many candidates where Believe it or not, within weeks sometimes, in such a, that, I'm not even kidding, within weeks, uh, Vinay, do you know that that, 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 that is happening? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, well, I didn't either. And I just found out. So I guess I'm on the market again within weeks. So uh, do your homework. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Do your homework. Uh, be well prepared. Write down three important questions that you want to ask that are outside the scope of the job description, completely outside of the scope of the job description about the company, what the company's done in your history, what they're currently doing, what makes you excited about their future and anything else that you see that might be potentially a red flag. Uh, this is your career. Um, That's so true. And I feel like I, and I would imagine maybe some students when they hear this, they might think to themselves, well, shoot, I don't want to be offensive in the interview. I don't want to be, I don't want to come off as offending them if I ask these questions. I think what you're saying is that it's not offensive. It shows that you actually are one, have one done your homework and two, that you want to be educated, that you are looking at them in terms of, in terms of a fine, like a magnifying glass, just like they're looking at you with a magnifying glass. Is that correct? Yeah. And you don't have to make it, it doesn't have to be, you don't, you want to make sure that you don't come across offensive. So for example, 
let's say I read about uh, two plants shutting down. I might say, Mr. Hiring Manager, I wanted, I wanted to uh, just ask you, I see here uh, under current events that uh, last month there was an announcement that uh, two plants were shutting down in Mexico and uh, Texas. Is that strategic? Will, that, uh, will there be new locations that are opening up? Is that for uh, uh, cutting uh, revenue costs to uh, increase a uh, new digital or new initiatives? Something like that. You're inquisitive. You're curious. You can make it a positive spin. They may say, that's exactly right, Vinay. Those two uh, plants are ant uh, old and antiquated. They're legacy. So we've decided to shut them down and open up a, a much larger operation here at corporate. We're going to open up a totally new building, totally high tech. Thank you for asking that. There's nothing and wrong with that. By asking the question, you showed that you did your homework. Right. right. And that's and it allows you to also assess them whether or not this was a this is a good fit for you. So I think that's a really good response. Is that you're a smart person that's out, that's thinking about the future and and uh, doing your homework. Yeah, due diligence. That's, that's exactly it. That People don't sense. do enough due diligence. Trust. You know, that's so fascinating. So it leads to like other questions that you can ask during the interview process. I would love to know, do you have any other suggested questions? And rather, even at the end of an interview, is it appropriate to ask for a timeline? And how do you normally approach that? Yeah. So every company is going to be different. Uh, and I say this, uh, I, I've, a, after managing 200 companies and hundreds of others with the people that have been in my groups, my, my staff, et cetera, um, there is no cookie cutter answer. There isn't. Anybody that tells you that they know it for sure is it's just not true because you, every personality and every person is different. So uh, there is nothing wrong with going on the first phone interview, being on a first, so I'll say it like this. If you're on, let's say it's a phone interview, first in person, second in person, final. Okay. So if it's on the first, uh, you're on the first phone interview, you may say something to the effect of, I understand that the phone interview is uh, concluded. Great. Uh, what is the timeline uh, for the in person? Uh, can you give me a, a, an idea of how your process works. That's an absolutely appropriate way of asking. Um, there's no reason why you have to say anything further. That's just a beautiful question to ask. How does your process work? You know, what is the timeline? Why not ask? Uh, you should always ask. I have told everybody that goes in, find that question out. Ask that. Don't leave it up to, don't walk up and say, thank you for your time and walk away. If you don't even ask that, that shows the company that you are not that motivated. Uh, it does come off that way. That is how the interviewer will perceive, could, could perceive your interest. If you don't even ask, what's the next steps? I'm very interested in the company. And you want to say that. That's a perfect way of just asking. I'm very interested in this company. I'm curious, what is the next steps in this process? Love that. That's a really good point. And do that for each interview. And yeah. when you get to the final, you might want to say, I'm really interested. I have a couple other things going on. This is uh, absolutely one of my uh, top uh, opportunities. What is the next step? Yeah. And I think some people might initially hear that advice and, and think to themselves, well, like, well, I don't want to be too pushy. I don't want to seem like I'm impatient, but it doesn't come off that way. It comes off that you're inquisitive and that you want to know what the next steps are. And I think you really did a great job of like shedding light into that. Now, one thing, by the way. Oh, yeah, go ahead. It shows you're engaged. I'm agreeing yeah. with you. Yeah. Well, right now, so there are 15 minutes left, left. Students, if you've got any questions, please post them in the comments area. Um, we'd love to answer any questions you may have for Vinay or myself. One thing that I am in really interested in, and it's it's essentially, I'm, I'm really interested in, in behavioral psychology and why some people really feel connected to others, especially in the interview process. So I was reading the book, Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini. He was talking about um, something you could do in the interview process that can help you set yourself apart. And that thing was this. He said, when you go into an interview, the very first thing that you should do is you should, you know, obviously immediately after shaking hands, before you start asking questions, you say something like this. You say, hey, first off, thank you so much for taking the time to interview with me today. Before we get started, I'm sure you had a lot of questions for, for me, but before we get started, I was hoping that I could ask you a question. And that question was, why did you decide to offer me the opportunity to interview with you today? And then like, let them answer it. And what he explains is that in by doing by asking that question, what it does is two things. One is it allows them to set the roadmap for why they liked you. 
It allows them to literally give them give you the rubric of what stood out about you in terms of your resume. They say might say like, hey, I really love that volunteer experience you had or really like that internship experience you had. But they might not talk about that part time job as a server that you had. And then in which case, when they ask you times about that, you times that you've ever faced adversity, don't talk about the server job because they've already told you that they're really interested in the volunteer role and the internship experience that you had. Um, and the other thing is that it causes them to prime them for success. They start thinking about you and the positive things that you've done as opposed to nitpicking some of the negative things that you've done. But I know it's a very different counterculture way of approaching interviews. What are your thoughts on that, Vinay? Is that totally out of the like left field? That is a uh, very interesting. Um, I like that question. Here is something that may potentially occur. Uh, uh, so the, my last five years was on the corporate side. And I can tell you countless times hiring managers have not looked at the resume until we're walking down the hall going into the interview. Uh, so I like the question because you'll figure out real quick, did the person read your resume or did they not? I can personally say I've been on interviews where I could tell the person never looked at my resume. Uh, but I like it. I like it a lot. It's a great, that's, that's good. That's good. And uh, I think even if they do fumble, like they're like, Oh crap, I didn't do my homework. They are, they'll, to, they'll say something. They'll say, Oh my goodness. Like, yes, I was going through it. And you know, these points really stood out to me, but th it's going to stick in their mind and they're going to feel bad. I think that is going to inherently want to like do more homework when they give you that follow-up interview. Yeah, for sure. They'll definitely do that if they like you. Absolutely. They'll, they'll, they'll have read your resume for the second round. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, I'd like to add to that. Yeah. Um, something that uh, has worked very well um, for, and this is a tried and true thing for, uh, for people uh, for a very long time. When you go on an interview, right, when you walk in, be quick for the first 60 seconds, 90 seconds to observe the surroundings of the office. Perfect example. If you catch that the hiring manager and behind in his bookshelf back here has a New York Giants helmet or a Dallas Cowboys helmet, and you happen to know about football. Great game last week, wasn't it? Good win. Opening that up takes somebody that might be potentially stuffy to yeah, yeah, it was. Are you a Dallas fan? Well, actually, I'm a, a Redskins fan. Ah, and all of a sudden, you just brought the person's guard down. So observe your surroundings and see if there's anything that you might want to open as an icebreaker. That's an important thing to do. I think that's cool. Uh, change the tone of the entire interview. It's happened to me personally. So I've gone to hundreds of companies, more even, maybe into the thousands, uh, and when you meet the client for the first time, it's always decision makers. It's, and oftentimes it's, it's SVPs or CIOs because these are the people that signed the contracts uh, for me to come in as a vendor. Um, I can't tell you how many times that we call them hot buttons. Um, you see something, married, children, um, anything that you can relate to, anything that's on the walls that you can relate to. If it's their office, they're going to have personal things. Uh, you know, they might have a whole bunch of coffee, different kinds of coffees. They might have a book that's on motivation and leadership. Oh, that's a great book on motivation and leadership. Uh, anything interesting? Anything. Yeah, that's you know, great. Often sports and stuff like that and things that are, their, that are their hobbies. And if it happens to relate, that's a winning ticket right there. Icebreaker. I love it. So we've got a couple of questions from some students I wanted to ask you. So Luke had the question. And that was, and I, I really like this question, is what, when, what is the best answer to a question from an interviewer that asks, what is your status with the recruitment process at other companies? And is that, even, is that an, an inappropriate question to ask from the interviewer? And why would a recruiter or hiring manager even ask that? Oh, okay, so the reason why they're asking that is to gauge if you're going to be off the market soon. They will typically ask that if there is a level of interest. If there is no interest, they won't ask that question. So you can, a good response could be something like, I am interviewing and speaking with a, a few companies. I do have some irons in the fire. Something that I've always said, I've told everybody to say, 
irons in the fire, but I'm very focused on this company right now and our conversation and, um, you know, something like that. So you want to say, yes, I do have some irons in the fire, uh, but I am interested in, in this company and I'm very motivated uh, to move this uh, process forward. I love that. And that was the way you, you, the way you answer that question was perfect. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm a huge fan of Robert Cialdini and behavioral psychology. Um, but one thing that he even suggests was the power of providing a negative potential response followed by, but yet, or however, and then going into something positive. So for example, was if someone ever asked the question, what is your greatest weakness for students? I strongly suggest just saying, Hey, you know what? My greatest weakness is that I'm an experience but I'm extremely hardworking, I'm eager to learn more, and I'm, I'm hungry to become a better professional and, and excited to get into it. And the way that you answered that from, from Luke's question was perfect was, you know, hey, I do have some iron in the fire, but I'm really focused on this opportunity at hand and I'm excited to learn more. Yes, exactly. That's awesome. Um, so Sammy asked the question, should you bring up the things that you are looking in, for in a workplace in the interview? In other words, if you hear something that strikes you as a red flag in an interview, should you address it? Uh, I would not address a red flag, but I would make a very strong mental note. Um, if there are things that you're looking for uh, in an environment, sure, why not bring it up? Of course, I, I would suggest doing that. Uh, does the uh, person give any kind of example? I mean, let's just say you're looking for uh, uh, a company that is uh, growth. It, it has a lot of growth in their three to five year projection. Say I'm looking for a company that has a lot of uh, growth potential. Say I'm looking for a company that uh, is really investing in uh, their employees. Can you tell me about that? So what's the growth potential? Can you tell me about that? How do you invest in your employees? Tell me about that. Uh, I'm looking for a company that uh, promotes um, and encourages their employees uh, with um, getting involved in other departments. Do you have any kind of program? Can you tell me about that? I'm looking for uh, a company that has uh, multiple uh, social groups within the company. Um, so the employees are growing together. Can you tell me about that? So Something almost on. like taking that red flag and responding with inquisitiveness about sure. how it could be alleviated and kind of giving them almost the lead into uh, or more or less redeeming themselves from whatever red flag that you're identifying. Is that correct? Well, so if I understood the question uh, correctly, uh, they, 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 were they asking for red flag? Uh, something no, no, that they she, just, she just mentioned like, hey, if I, if I notice that there's a red flag in the interview process, maybe they say something like, yeah, and you know, maybe you really want to work in Chicago. And they say in the interview, something like, yeah, so we start you in Chicago for six months, but then we rotate our people out to different, you know, branches. And you might be thinking to yourself, like, I don't want to rotate out. Like, I've got a family in Chicago. I want to be in Chicago. That's where my friends are. Like, that could be the red flag. That could be something that she might be referring to or any other red flag that she identifies. Be authentic and say up front what you, how you feel, because the last thing you want to do is don't say anything, get an offer, and then either take a job where you're going to end up rotating, but you don't want to, or say that after the fact, when you could have said it before, when they could have said, uh, you know, Vinay, uh, when I brought that up to you, you didn't say anything on the interview, and now here we are giving you the offer. That would be burning a bridge, sort of. So if you hear something that you, there's not, that's, that's not, I wouldn't say that's a red flag. Um, they're telling you what they're looking for and you need to tell them what you're looking for. You want to find a right match and you don't want to walk away saying, boy, I didn't ask that. I wish I asked that because now it's a lingering question mark. And if I get the offer, will I take it? Will I not take it? Will I hurt myself? Will I hurt my career? Will I? So you want to be upfront. There's nothing wrong with being upfront. Um, but you'll have to weigh that. That's, that's an individual thing. Uh, let's just say you're on the fence and you kind of don't want to leave Chicago, uh, but, and you really don't want to rotate. But at the end of the day, let's say you really don't have many irons in the fire and you really, really want a job and you like the company, then I, I, would, I would think about that. And you may want to come back and address it in an email after you thought about it or at the next, at the next interview process. Uh, so that's an individual thing. There is no right or wrong answer. It's just, it's, 
It's an impossible thing. Depends on the person, depends on their circumstance. But this is something that you want to want to think about and think about it up front. If you really are dead set of not of not look at leaving Chicago, then don't rotate. Yeah. You're, All right. Good, good call. call. That, that's a really good answer. You don't want to be unhappy. Yeah, of course. So Garrett has a question. How do HR companies monitor your social media profiles? Yeah. This is ever changing. It is ever changing. It is ever growing. Um, is some companies do more than others. And, uh, um, but I will tell you this, uh, if you have a lot of posts, yeah, I was going to bring this up anyway. So I'm glad uh, that somebody actually asked this. If you have a lot of images on your, uh, social accounts, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and it might be a lot of late night activities from college and enjoying yourself and stuff like that. You're going to want to think about maybe taking some of that stuff down. Uh, you're moving out of college and you're going into a professional career. And the fact of the matter is companies are looking at your social media. They're looking at your digital footprint. They're looking at everything. And there is no right answer that all companies do this. There is no answer to that. And any, nobody can say that there is an answer to that. Every company does different things. And the more tech savvy they are, I take that back. Who knows what they're looking at? Some companies go to more of an extreme and some, and some don't. Some have policies that are, it really depends on each individual company, what they're looking for and how extreme they're looking to go into your social media. But uh, it is a thing. It is a norm. Uh, they're all looking at social media at one level or another. And so you're going to, Look, it's the fact of life today. Uh, it you know, twenty years ago, ten years ago, not so much. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Absolutely. So, so what Vinay, you say, go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say what you say, and how you say what you say, and what your images look like. They're looking at it. Everybody's looking at it. Everybody's looking at it. Great point. Looking at all. So of us. Vinay, thank you. This has been extremely insightful. I feel like we have dropped a ton of knowledge on these students in terms of preparing for the interview. We've covered some really specific topics that I think are really, really helpful. These are probably outside of the realm of the ordinary. I mean, you can go to your career service office. And by the way, I strongly encourage that you do. You go to them, you get resume advice, you get cover letter advice, you do mock interviews, you prepare as much as you can using all the resources that you can. Um, but I think these tips that you and I have discussed today really shed a lot on, on things that aren't often talked about in the interview process. Um, and I, Luke, I really liked your question because it was very specific and it's definitely something that happens. And Vinay, I think you had a really great response to it. But I wanted to ask you, Vinay, now that we're starting to close up this workshop, how can students find you? How can students get in touch with you? How can they, how can they stay in the loop with what's going on with your world? You know, I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of posting on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and I encourage everybody to start moving on to uh, and building up your, your LinkedIn because that's where you want to be. That's where you're going to want to, that's where employers are looking first and foremost. So uh, I am happy to connect, uh, have people connect and follow me. Um, if you have a question, feel free to ask me. Um, but uh, so would you, uh, Garrett, you, you have my uh, LinkedIn or is there somewhere I should put it? Yeah, well, what we'll do is we'll just essentially, if you go on LinkedIn, you just type in Vinay Singh. Um, you can find obviously Vinay there. Um, I can also post probably the link to your um, your LinkedIn in the comments in, in like the bottom of this video. So that's another way that students can find you. But we did actually have one last second question from Belle. She asked the question of how do you answer the question of, of where do you see yourself five years from now? Yeah, that was a question that uh, they're still asking that, aren't they? Yeah, uh, I don't see many of it's, it's getting less and less and less. Um, where do I see myself in five years? Uh, you, I guess the answer is it's, it's really it's just such an old question. Uh, I, I, it goes back decades. Uh, the answer is I look forward to being in this company and growing my career here at X, Y and Z company. I mean, it's that simple. I've heard people say something like, uh, I hope to be sitting in your seat. Um, no hiring manager wants to hear that. Um, I hope to be a VP at this company <coughs> or C -E CIO if you're in technology or CMO if you're marketing. I wouldn't suggest anything like that. 
something to the effect of I, I'm looking for a long term career uh, at this company, X, Y and Z. Let's say it's Google. I'm looking for a long term career at Google and I'm looking forward to moving into uh, moving into uh, more robust roles uh, that uh, that I hope uh, Google will find uh, that uh, I have a lot to offer and uh, look forward to being at this company for the long haul. That's what you want to say. You want to be at the company, but you don't want to say anything specific. Like I want to be an executive, top executive. Not a good, not a good answer. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a really good response. Well, Vinay, thank you. This has been awesome. I'm really grateful that you were here for this workshop. I think your insight was fantastic, really relevant to the students. Um, thank you for being here. And students, thank you for being here. Remember your deliverable. Your deliverable is to find another accountability partner and share three things that you learned this past week with them. Um, this could be from the workshop. This could be through your classes. This could be literally anything that you're learning about your own professional growth and development. Share that with your accountability and learn their, your, your accountability partner and learn about and just share with them why that was important to you. And just essentially have someone that you can share with. Take a picture with that person and send it to either myself or Sydney. And um, alternatively, you can just post it on LinkedIn. And in fact, I think you should do both. Because that just shows that you're learning new things. I mean, posting about what you're learning in these workshops is very LinkedIn appropriate because it's professionally driven. I mean, this is this is essentially the hotbed for LinkedIn content. Learning about interviews and things that you want to apply. I mean, that's something you should post. Just tag us and we'll count it. Um, yeah. And then the last part is our referral program. If you could help encourage students to get involved in this program, share this program with other students, we'd be super grateful for that. And if you're enjoying the program, I, if you don't mind hopping on your phone and taking a quick video of yourself sharing about your experience and sending it over to me, I would really appreciate that. I think that would really help encourage other students to get involved and take advantage of this program. Thank you all for being here this evening. Vinay, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm so glad that we could do this. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your Sunday night. Thanks, Garrett. Pleasure.